We have such an exciting lineup for you today. Um, the Honorable Portia Simpson Miller is going to be here with us, and we're so excited that she's here with us. And um, we have a very, hopefully, a very lively group willing to ask provocative questions as we talk about Caribbean politics. And um, I'm really excited to be here again. I can't, I can't even count which year this is for me, but um, it's like a reunion of sorts, and I always, always enjoy it. First up, I'd like to invite. Dr. Jean Rahir, the director of the African um, Diaspora Studies, to please come on up. Thank you. So it is my pleasure to welcome you all um, to what is now the 11th Eric Williams Memorial Lecture. I must begin uh, my uh, brief remarks by uh, recognizing, acknowledging the founding role played by Dr. Carol Boyce Davies in uh, founding the, putting together, in beginning the, the long tradition of the uh, Eric E. Williams Memorial Lecture some 11 years ago. So I would uh, assure that she would uh, enjoy a well-deserved round of applause and I would you know, invite you to. <clears throat> So the African and African Diaspora Studies program will continue to uh, support the tradition of holding every year during the fall semester this distinguished annual lecture series. Uh, since we understand that this is in fact an important link, it provides us, it gives us an important link uh, to the communities we serve and represent here at FIU. So it is my pleasure as well to recognize uh, the presence among us of some special guests. And uh, I will then list them. Uh, there is, first of all, an FIU trustee, uh, Mr. Al Dodson. There is, um, there is also, of course, the, uh, the vice uh, president of FIU, for Student Affair, Dr. Rosa Jones. And then we have uh, the, um, the presence of uh, Miss Laura, Laura Marie West, who is the Consul General of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. But she's, she's, about to... she's in fact for the moment represented by Mr. Kirk Francois, who is the Deputy Consul General uh, of the Republic of Trinidad. So there is as well, uh, of course, an, an important person tonight, Miss Sandra Grant Griffith, who is the Consul General of Jamaica. <clears throat> so, um, let me see. I must as well uh, acknowledge uh, the fact that the the lecture, the, this annual lecture received proclamations and greetings from uh, a series of um, uh, elected officials, among whom uh, the Florida Governor Charlie Crist, U.S. Senator Bill Nelson, U.S. Congressman Alcy Hastings and Howard Berman, U.S. Congresswomen Debbie Wasserman Schultz, Ileana uh, Ross Lettinen and Barbara Lee, and the mayors of Lode Hill, Miramar, the village of El Portal, the city of Miami, Broward County, Streetwater, Coral Gables, Coconut Creek, the village of Pine, Pine Crest, Miami-Dade County, and the city of Pembroke Pines. So um, I must also recognize uh, Ray Brathwaite, who came especially from Trinidad and Tobago, and Jalil Dabdub, who uh, came especially for, uh, from Jamaica to attend this, this lecture. So I don't know they, where they are. Um, and then, of course, we must, I'm, I'm, I want to congratulate and thank very much some of my colleagues, my FIU colleagues, who have uh, uh, you know, requested their students to, uh, and given uh, uh, to their students some extra credit for attending uh, tonight's lecture. Yeah, so hopefully, it's just, um, so 
before I uh, cede the microphone to the next person, I will take the opportunity to remind everyone that, uh, in fact, uh, AADS, uh, the African and African Diaspora Studies uh, here at FIU, has engaged in a series of changes. Uh, first, we changed the name of the program from ANWS, or African New World Studies, to African and African Diaspora Studies. We moved from uh, what some call a peripheral or a, 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 a campus to the main campus, which is a Modesto Medica campus. We uh, have uh, streamlined and changed a series of, uh, of uh, things in, in the academic programs we offer. We changed the curriculum of the undergraduate certificate. We now offer an entirely online undergraduate certificate in African, in African diaspora studies. We changed the curriculum of, the, of our MA program in African and African diaspora studies. We have an MA that stands on its own. But we also have developed uh, three uh, combined MA in African and African diaspora studies and PhD in uh, three, uh, uh, with three different uh, uh, PhD programs, Atlantic history, and global and sociocultural studies. So to, these two should be uh, open, hopefully, uh, within uh, this academic year. And with one of them, uh, the third one that is already open for uh, applications, which is the MA in African and African Diaspora Studies and PhD in International Relations. So uh, we also now offer a study program, um, and we hope that we'll have enough uh, students uh, enrolled uh, to make it this year and uh, the study abroad program in the summer 2010 uh, to Senegal and the Gambia. Uh, so I invite everyone to check us out and check our uh, website at uh, africana.fiu.edu. So um, I must as well uh, now recognize the co-sponsors of this lecture within uh, FIU. We received uh, you know, generous uh, help from the College of Arts and Sciences, the School of International and Public Affairs, the Shepherd Broad International Lecture Series, the Women's Studies Center, the African and African Diaspora Studies Graduate Students Association, and the Latin American and Caribbean Center. So, um, I will then uh, at this point uh, introduce um, my um, superior who is the, uh, the, the Dr. Uh, Nicole Ray who is the Senior Associate Dean for Arts and Sciences. So let's welcome uh, Dr. Ray. Superior only in the administrative hierarchy, I think. Um, ladies and gentlemen, consuls, uh, it's a great pleasure uh, to welcome you on behalf of the College of Arts and Sciences. Uh, Dean Furton could not be here tonight. Unfortunately, he was called out of town, but I am very honored to have the opportunity to uh, represent him for the second consecutive year. Um, this... Uh, is a particularly important event uh, for um, FIU and our local Caribbean community. And so I'm particularly delighted to welcome members of that community and students and faculty interested in Caribbean affairs to our lecture tonight as well. I'm very honored to welcome our distinguished guest, former Prime Minister Portia Simpson Miller. Uh, last year, um, our, our guest came from Trinidad, so we've moved a little bit north in the Caribbean this year to recognize another major player in the region, uh, Jamaica. And of course, I know many of you here tonight, I sure have a personal connection to that beautiful island. Um, I shan't detain you much longer. Uh, it is my great pleasure to, um, to introduce another uh, prominent figure here at FIU. Uh, in January, of this year, we inaugurated our new School of International and Public Affairs, of which the African and African Diaspora Studies program is, uh, is a part. And um, I'm quite astonished how prominent a feature of the FIU scene uh, the 
School of International Public Affairs, or SIPA, or sometimes SIPA as we call it, I don't think we've ever resolved that issue, uh, has become. Uh, from something that was just a twinkle in Dean Ferton's eye in January 2008, we now have a school that is getting increasing recognition in our local community, and also, I think, nationally and even internationally. Um, the director of the school, its first director, is a distinguished FIU faculty member who's been a tremendous servant of the institution and a distinguished academic in his own right. So it's my great pleasure to introduce my colleague, John F. Stack, Jr. Uh, welcome, everybody, and thank you, Nickel, for such a generous and gracious introduction. And welcome, of course, to our new School of International and Public Affairs. On Wednesday at 2 a.m., 50 cement trucks proceeded to the FIU campus to pour 400 cubic yards of concrete, which, become, which became the foundation for our new school building, uh, which will sit next to the FIU airport control tower, probably the most enduring, for those of us who are old-timers, symbol of FIU's rise. Uh, I think that's an auspicious occasion, uh, and uh, I am, I'm just delighted by the progress that we, we are making. The building is a, a standout contribution by Architectonica. It's a spectacular building, and I think it suggests our international aspirations. It, it certainly suggests what we should do, and I think will do. President Rosenberg asked me to send his warmest regards tonight. He is traveling and regrets that he cannot be here with you this evening. But he asked me to convey his belief that the Eric Williams Memorial Lecture Series epitomizes how the life of the mind and a commitment to public service continue to inspire and empower. The creation of the School of International and Public Affairs uh, within FIU's College of Arts and Sciences suggests to me a commitment to the study of the international in the context of a dynamic socio-cultural metropolis. The destiny of Miami is defined in many significant measures by the peoples of the Caribbean. Our success is your success. Eric Williams's intellectual contributions continue to cast a formidable and I think lengthening presence in a community and a region defined by the forces of globalization in both positive and negative ways. Dr. Williams understood the relentless forces of capitalism, of colonialism and slavery and the transformational impact of globalization in the Caribbean in terms of civil society relations, diplomacy, economics, race, class, and culture. That we, that we have much to learn about globalization in the greater Caribbean, and by the greater Caribbean, I mean South Florida as well. Uh, we welcome uh, today uh, a distinguished uh, political leader, diplomat, and student uh, of world politics in uh, former Prime Minister Portia Simpson uh, Miller. And tonight, it makes Jamaica all the more relevant, understanding that Jamaica's experience for more than five centuries underscores the processes of the intensification and attenuation of global economic relations that we experienced so vividly here and around the world in 2008 and continue to experience in 2009. Jamaica has much to teach us, and on Sunday, November 16th at 4 p.m. in FIU's Green Library, we will celebrate the launch of, the, of Jamaica's premier historical journal uh, in our Latin American and Caribbean Center's Digital Library of the Caribbean, which is a tremendous FIU resource. The Jamaica Journal is a flagship publication of the Institute of Jamaica and the Caribbean's leading cultural publication on Jamaica's extraordinary history and heritage, and I hope to see many of you there. 
Tonight, I want to acknowledge as well Carol Boyce Davies' years of stewardship at FIU. Uh, Carol did a marvelous job in launching our, uh, our studies of Africa uh, uh, in the diaspora. And I also want to acknowledge my friend and colleagues, uh, Jean Rehaire's creativity, determination, and restless energy and for his building of African and African Diaspora Studies program here at the Modesto A. Medic campus. And of course, by no means least, Erica Williams' passion and commitment to the legacy of her extraordinary, extraordinary father. President Rosenberg has described universities as communities of memory and hope. Tonight, we celebrate the promise of diversity and in the words of Eric Williams himself, in the note that he sent aboard Apollo 11, the hope, and I've, I've tweaked it a little bit, the hope and the quest for better worlds. Welcome to FIU, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Stack, and thank you, FIU, for your continued commitment to this amazing event. And one quick housekeeping note. Um, if you haven't done so already, please put your cell phones on vibrate or silent. And I'm sure if you don't know how to do so, one of these lovely young people can show you how to do it. <laughs> Not to saying that our, you know, our old people can't, but they, are, they, have, special, they have special skills. Um, up next, we have um, Dr. Chantal Verna. She's an so assistant professor of history and politics and international relations. Um, and also, she is with the African and African Diaspora Studies Department as an affiliate faculty member. Thank you, and good evening. Uh, I'd like to also make a special note of the fact that we are, for the first time, webcasting, web streaming this program to the University of West Indies and St. Augustine. And so I'd like to send greetings to all those who are watching and participating and joining us uh, via the internet. And also thank you to the staff who is making that possible. And a special note also to my students for International and Caribbean Relations course who uh, were very glad to join us here today. This evening I have the privilege of on introducing the most honorable Mrs. Portia Lucretia Simpson Miller, Order of the Nation, Member of Parliament, and Leader of Jamaica's Opposition, the People's National Party, PNP. Like Dr. Eric Williams, who we've come here tonight to honor, Mrs. Simpson Miller has created for herself her own historic role in Caribbean and world politics. She is widely known for her unprecedented election to the presidency of the PNP when she succeeded P.J. Patterson in February 2006 and became the first woman to hold the office of prime minister in Jamaica. She held that position until September 11, 2007, and during her tenure as prime minister, she was only one of seven women of 192 nations around the world who led their nations. Mrs. Simpson Miller pursued her education up to secondary level in Jamaica and then received her Bachelor of Arts degree in public administration from the Union Institute and University, where she later earned an honorary doctorate. Her academic achievements also include completion of the Executive Leadership Program for Development at John F. Kennedy School of Government, Harvard University. Mrs. Simpson Miller's com commitment to Jamaican representational politics has been a more than three decades long journey. It began formally in 1974 when she won the important inner city constituency of Trenchtown West for the PNP. This was just one of many firsts that she would accomplish for the party. She is a native of one of Jamaica's poorer working class communities, Woodhall St. Catherine. Thus her political ascension has signaled a fresh opportunity not only for Jamaican women, but also for all those who are concerned about transcending poverty and inequalities in Jamaican society. Sister P, as she is affectionately referred to by her supporters, has declared eradicating these social ills her top priority. 
She has worked to involve communities in the process of policymaking, set up networks for childcare to encourage the participation of women in the labor market, and instituted reforms via urban and community development. She has held several ministerial positions in which she has helped to improve labor conditions and labor relations in Jamaica, created plans for sustainable tourist development, and in honor of her passion for athletics and her love of Jamaica's athletes, she's promoted important strides in Jamaica's sporting community and used sport as a unifying force for rival political factions. Mrs. Simpson Miller's work has been duly recognized internationally. Her honors include the 2007 Women in Sports Trophy from the International Olympic Committee, leadership positions in the Organization of American States, Caribbean Forum of Ministers, and the United Nations. Cooperation at the local, regional, and international levels also concerns Mrs. Simpson Miller. And in her 2009 New Year's Address to the Nation, she emphasized the importance of unity. She will address this theme tonight stressing her vision about the importance and the possibilities of regional inter integration concerns two issues that were of concern to both Norman Manley, the founding father of the PNP, and Dr. Eric Williams. At a time when Jamaica and the Caribbean face increasingly complex challenges whose resolution demands broad range cooperation, we are pleased to have this evening the benefit of a lecture by a woman who knows that much work remains to be done and who has consistently expressed her vigilance and her capacity to getting it done. It is my pleasure to welcome to FIU and to the podium the 11th annual Eric Williams Memorial Lecturer, the Honorable Portia Simpson Miller. Thank you, thank you very much. Dr. Raher, Dr. Ray, Honorable Laura West, Dr. Verno, Dr. John Stack, Nikki Mohan, and I'd like to recognize the presence of Mr. Ray Brathwaite and a special recognition of the Consul General of Jamaica and I ask her to stand. Thank you, Sandra. I'd ask for you to recognize Mr. Ray Brathwaite who traveled from Trinidad. And I want to thank him for attending. And businessman Mr. Dub Dub from Jamaica. Officials of FIU, distinguished ladies and gentlemen present here, and ladies and gentlemen watching on the internet. I am honored by the invitation to join previous illustrious lecturers who have participated in this prestigious lecture series. And it is my privilege to deliver this, the 11th Eric Williams Memorial Lecture to such an August audience here at Florida International University. I commend those responsible for organizing this distinguished Africana Scholars Lecture Series and extend commendation to Ms. Erika Williams Connell for the part she plays in keeping alive the memory of her father, this great Caribbean icon. Dr. Eric Williams deserves no less. Erica, will you stand? Thank you so much, my Caribbean sister. Let me convey to you warm greetings from the beautiful island of Jamaica 
itself a highly branded entity in the family of the Anglophone Caribbean. Our region has a history of struggle against transgressions from slavery to indentureship, both rooted in exploited labor. Our region has been through colonialism, its subjugation of our people, and the associated racism. Presently, we are faced with new forms of inequity and vulnerability. Ladies and gentlemen, economic underdevelopment, fueled by the continuing hegemonic control by developed economic centers, has resulted in difficulties for the people of the Caribbean. The region owes a debt of gratitude to iconic pioneers such as Dr. Eric Williams. He and others of his generation, including Norman Manley and Grantley Adams, left us a proud heritage of perseverance and tenacity. The struggle for greater economic independence, regional unity, national pride, cultural liberation, and for general prosperity must continue in their memory. I am a proud beneficiary of their legacies. I come to you in this spirit and with a commitment to pursue those dreams. I particularly want to pay tribute to the man we honor through these lectures. That Dr. Williams stood like a colossus in pointing directions towards a modern Caribbean, capable of coping with turbulence, contradictions, and chaos of post-colonial life, is impatient of debate. Books such as Capitalism and Slavery and From Columbus to Castro are remarkable scholarly works that have documented the outstanding contribution of the people of the Caribbean to global economic development. As we examine the contribution of the Caribbean to the world, I cannot but also reflect on a similar foundational work, how Europe underdeveloped Africa by another outstanding son of the region, Dr. Walter Rodney. Both Williams and Rodney showed us how the interconnectedness of the world can at times be parasitical. The South Commission of 1990, in asserting that there have been massive transfers of wealth from the South to the North, confirms the veracity of the work of these visionaries. Ladies and gentlemen, as we look at a new vision for a new world reality, permit me to reflect on where we were and where we are today, even as we contemplate the future. In this presentation, I will advance three main points. First, that the post-Williams era is changing and new players are emerging in the international economic system. My second point will be that the Caribbean's competitive advantage lies not only in its natural resources, but in its people. Finally, I will posit some urgent imperatives to enhance the social and economic status of the people of the region. Ladies and gentlemen, I have adopted this approach because the response of this generation must be to interpret present day realities and to strengthen and build structures and institutions for integrating the Alcophone and wider Caribbean. This is a necessary, necessary imperative to civilization. It is also a fundamental strategy for wealth creation and retention. Ladies and gentlemen, 50 years ago, the countries of the Anglophone Caribbean were all colonies of British Empire. All were colonies of the British Empire. 
foreign and defense policies were the purview of the colonial powers. Geopolitical realities were dictated by the Cold War. Relationships were determined by where each country, each political organization, trade union, and even each individual stood in relation to the dominant players in the, that Cold War. It was in that context that on obtaining independence in 1962, the then Prime Minister of Jamaica, the Right Excellent Sir Alexander Bustamante, when asked about the foreign policy direction of Jamaica, answered in a single and simple sentence, we are with the West. At that time, the major contradiction was between the countries of the West, led by the United States, and those in the East, led by the Soviet Union. It is through that prism that developments in the world were judged. The Berlin Wall was the most visible symbol of that divide. There were, of course, those who never accepted this division as permanent, as this polarity excluded the majority of the people of the world from the power equation. The non-aligned movement with giants like Tito, Nehru, Burnham, and others were part of what Michael Manley called the search for solutions on behalf of the people of the South. Their struggle for a new international economic order was an essential part of that quest for equality, respect, and justice in international affairs. For the masses of the people, however, it was a struggle up the down escalator to use Manley's well-stated paradox of the struggle for development. The Berlin Wall has since been torn down. But in a relatively short period of time, the world moved from a bipolar power structure to a single superpower in which it was easy to declare, either you are with us or you are against us. Ladies and gentlemen, even before the world could adjust to one superpower, signs of fundamental change in the world economic order began to emerge. So, from an ideological bipolar construct to a unipolar domain, the dynamism of change is leading towards a multipolar paradigm. What are some of the evidence of this change? The United States has long been a friend and an important trading partner of our region and has made tremendous contribution to our development. Caribbean peoples have benefited from bilateral and multilateral agreements. Many Caribbean citizens have built homes and communities in the United States of America. There is also no doubt that we as a people have contributed to the prosperity of the United States. The Caribbean therefore cannot ignore global trends that impact the United States. The United States share of global GDP has been reduced, moving from 50% in 1945 to 25% in 1980. Today, because of the growth of other players in the global economy, the United States' share of global GDP is only 20%. Another indication of realignment of the global economy is the fact that the percentage of world's reserves held in US dollars is also declining. This moved from 71% in 1999 to only 63% last year. It is suggested in some quarters that this trend is likely to continue. Simultaneously, Brazil, Russia, India, and China, the BRIC countries, 
are now playing a major role in the world economy. China, which was once seen as an underdeveloped country, is now the third largest single economy in the world. Its GDP is valued at 7.8 trillion US dollars. Last year, their trade surplus was 300 billion US dollars, and their fiscal surplus was 18.1 billion dollars. While a number of the traditional leading economies face severe challenges, the Chinese economy grew by 9% during this year. Ladies and gentlemen, this is of course another signal that the world has and is rapidly changing. Ten years ago, meetings of the G8 were considered with awe. Today, the meetings of the G20 nations dwarf the meetings of the G8. In our hemisphere, there's the emergence of the, Bolivide, the Bolivide, Bolivarian Alliance of the Americans. I don't know if you all know about the Bolivarian Alliance of the Americas, which is the ALBO. I'm sure most of you and the students would know this and the professors, the educators. With countries such as Bolivia, Venezuela, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Dominica, Antigua and Barbuda, and Grenada constituting its membership with a combined population of over 73 million people and a GDP of nearly 700 billion US dollars. The strident call for an inclusive region at the recent summit of the Americas, held in Dr. Williams' own Trinidad and Tobago, is yet another indicator of the changes in the world's power structure. There can be no doubt that the world is not where it used to be, but neither is it where we want it to be. These are realities which the Caribbean must consider as it prepares to confront the opportunities and challenges of the future. There is no doubt that the present realities present the region with an opportunity to advance the issues of a new international economic order advocated by leaders of the South for decades. Ladies and gentlemen, we owe it to our people to ensure that we seize the opportunities presented in this new paradigm to uplift and empower those who have become victims of globalization. Issues such as global warming, global governance, debt management, transfer of technology, equitable trade, and sustainable development must remain at the forefront of the global agenda. It is within this context of the new world reality that we must craft a vision for the Caribbean. That vision must begin with what we have. It must recognize our competitive advantage. Despite Trinidad and Tobago's oil, and Jamaica and Guyana's bauxite, the Caribbean cannot claim to be the owners of vast minerals and other natural resources. We have never been the industrial center of the world. We have never had multinational corporations through which to create wealth. And despite our long history of agriculture rooted in slavery, we cannot claim to be the agricultural food basket of the world. Above all, we do not have military might. So what do we have? The Caribbean has a strong, recognizable global brand. We have skill, ingenuity, and talent. Our greatest asset is our people. We are a people with an industrious spirit that is seen in our human and social affairs. We live within a creative and accommodating Creole region. We are a people who are well-traveled, well-known, well-recognized, demanded, and awarded. We are a people known for our culture of music, dance, language, religion, cuisine, 
beauty, sport, and fashion. We are a resilient people. We have determination, inner strength, and a fighting spirit that lies within us, bequeathed to us by our ancestors and our forebears. Against this background, the question may be asked, why then has the Caribbean remained relatively underdeveloped? Perhaps it is that many of us as decision makers have chosen the safe traditional path. The call from Marcus Mosiah Garvey, put into song by Bob Marley, to emancipate ourselves from mental slavery has been echoed by Naeem Akbar, who suggests that more of us need to break the chains of psychological slavery. Nettleford's inward stretch, outward reach, beckons the people of the Caribbean to resist the temptation of simply blaming others whilst ignoring our potential to achieve greatness in the world. Ladies and gentlemen, we must do this despite what an esteemed academic from the region describes as the faceless, ruthless, non-accountable, non-transparent, but powerful phenomenon called globalization. The Caribbean is obliged to transform itself even as it contemplates a development path without preferential access for its commodities, declining developmental grants, and reduced remittances. Ladies and gentlemen, despite the challenges, the Caribbean is not without real possibilities for development. The region has produced academics the likes of Arthur Lewis, Derek Walcott, and V.S. Naipaul. Creative artists the likes of Bob Marley, the mighty Sparrow, and Jimmy Cliff. Scientists and business leaders, sportsmen the likes of Usain Bolt and Brian Lara, philosophers and visionaries. And many others of these abound in the towns and villages of the Caribbean. We are a great people and we produce great sons and daughters. If the region is to achieve its full potential, it has a responsibility to remove structural impediments that have acted as barriers to the release of the creativity, intellectual acumen, and dynamism of our people. Imagine if our people are organized, marketed, facilitated, capitalized, and empowered in a real way, the impact that they would make on the world? Ladies and gentlemen, it is this vision of success, of triumph, of wealth, and prosperity that drives our ambition to become a region of developed countries. To do this, greater regional cooperation is an imperative. Let me echo Eric Williams himself, himself, who as far back as 1969 told the fifth meeting of the heads of government of the Anglophone Caribbean in what can only be described as a clarion call for integration when he said, and I quote, the most developed nations of the world are today grouping together for economic, social, and political reasons. If we, the present leaders of Caribbean governments, fail our people of today, our children, and those unborn will never forgive us. If we fail to bury petty differences, and give and take in this whole exercise of regional cooperation. And if we fail to capitalize on our tremendous achievements during the past years, if we lose the grip of success which we achieved, we may never have the opportunity to do so in our lifetimes." End of quote. Ladies and gentlemen, we have the opportunity 
to translate Williams' hopes into lasting reality. In this context, there are challenges which the Caribbean region must address in its efforts to improve the social economic status of our peoples. The list of these new and emerging challenges is long and time does not permit an exhaustive discourse, but I would like to propose a few areas which I believe to be critical if the Caribbean is not to be left behind in the new world reality. The consideration of these issues should in no way be interpreted as diminishing the relevance of issues such as HIV AIDS, crime and violence, and other social phenomenon impacting the Caribbean and indeed the world. The current global recession has caused pain, anguish, and anxiety for the peoples of the world. Yet, I have chosen not to speak specifically to that issue today, as I believe that with appropriate actions, this too will pass in a few years. Today, I want to consider a strategic long-term view of development as we assess the new world reality and the prospects for the Anglophone Caribbean. The first obvious imperative as the region considers prospects for the Anglophone Caribbean is a regional development plan to take our nations to the cutting edge of sustainable development. Such a plan must give cognizance to each country's specific plan, but it must also give priority to common issues and processes critical to enhancing the quality of the lives of all the peoples of the region. This plan must be made in the context of a regional governance system that is participatory, accountable, and transparent. In other words, it must be the people's plan. We are some, I, I would like for us to perhaps now um, look at some of the elements of this plan. What are some of the elements? Firstly, for the region to demonstrate concrete manifestation of a full understanding of the new realities, regional mechanism must provide opportunities for the people of Dominica to turn on their television sets and see the news and other programs from St. Lucia or Trinidad and Tobago or any other country in the region. This would not only expose each of the country's uniqueness, but also provide collective awareness of markets for goods and services. Ladies and gentlemen, a number of possibilities present themselves in the tourism sector. Since the early 1960s, tourism has been one of the mainstay of the region's economy. Classically, individual countries have pursued their own tourism strategies. Without seeking to deny the opportunity of an individual countries to highlight those specific and unique aspects which differentiate them from other destinations, the region should increase collaboration in areas of common interests, such as research, product development, marketing, and air transportation. It should be possible for citizens of the region to travel to the various islands of the Caribbean and even to the wider region by direct flight. And despite the challenges of security, the region should draw on the experience of Cricket World Cup, where a single visa facilitated travel throughout the region. This would allow visitors to the various islands the opportunity to enjoy the ackee and salt fish of Jamaica, the flying fish and cuckoo of Barbados, the bus of short roti of Trinidad, and all the other exotic tastes, 
sights and the sounds of the region with greater ease. <laughs> of course, the attributes which make each country unique have not been fully optimized. I am sure you all will agree with me. There's much more to be gained through health tourism, ecotourism, heritage tourism, and sports tourism. And the region should develop a partnership in these areas. Can you imagine, for example, in sports, if we could have the best of the Caribbean against the rest of the world? Ah, can you imagine what would happen? Examine with me the implications of financial sector regulations for the region. Even as the world diversifies its economic arrangements, there is still a considerable interconnectedness of our systems. The economic crisis in the developed economies has revealed glaring deficiencies in the regulatory frameworks for their financial sectors. The actions they take to meet present realities will have implications for the economies and specifically the financial sector of our region. As a region, we must be proactive and develop unified, pragmatic, regional response that embraces best practices to protect our countries from any negative consequences of action taken in developed economies as they proceed to adjust their own system. Ladies and gentlemen, non-action is not an option. The financial sector regulations of which I speak is a compelling reason for a single market and economy. Let me invite you to explore just a few more issues which beg for regional cooperation. Any prospect for the Anglophone Caribbean must include serious consideration of its energy policies. Energy consumes the largest portion of the foreign earnings of many of the countries of the region. In 2008, 2008, Jamaica, for example, spent US $3.4 billion, or 40% of its import bill on oil. The region's efforts to provide world-class quality education, health care, transportation, and housing for its people will be severely challenged if it remains totally dependent on imported energy. The region must quicken the pace at which it explores opportunity because we must explore the opportunities for research and development of alternative renewable energy as we seek to more efficiently utilize that finite quantity of non-renewable resources available to us. The region must commit itself to energy cooperation and I would suggest that the work of the Center of Excellence for Renewable Resources established in Jamaica in 2006 be integrated with work being done elsewhere in the region to develop and utilize alternative energies such as solar, biofuels, hydropower, and wind, ener wind energy for the benefit of the entire region. I am sure we can do it. I am sure we can. The Anglophone Caribbean will find it challenging to face the prospects for the future without a regional energy plan. And I'm sure you will support me on this call for a regional energy plan. One of the first basic needs of man is food. There can be no real security without food security. A nation that does not feed itself is one that risks its own independence. 
The need to drastically reduce the region's nearly $3 billion food import bill was emphasized by President Jagdeo of Guyana when he presented a paper to his colleagues at heads of government meeting in 2004. If the region is not to compromise its independence, then greater attention should be given to reviewing and where practicable, implementing that regional food security plan. The issue of the environment is one of critical importance to the Caribbean. As small island states, we are vulnerable to national, natural disasters of various kinds. Hurricanes can cost a Caribbean island between 20 and 30% of its GDP. Last year, damage caused by hurricanes in Cuba was estimated to be over 10 billion US dollars. Any of our islands could be similarly affected as Jamaica, Grenada, the Caymans, and others certainly can attest. Cooperation to resuscitate social and physical infrastructure should become the joint effort of all of us. The Caribbean Insurance Scheme and Caribbean Emergency Disaster Response Organization are only a small part of the opportunities for collaboration and cooperation. Of course, disasters are not the only concerns of the region. The physical, social, and economic impact of climate change is happening before our very eyes. As tourist centers, rising sea levels will have dire consequences for our people and countries. Our vulnerability threatens our very viability. Protection of our environment is not a matter of choice for our Caribbean people. Yet, adoption of environmentally sound policies and technologies will involve costs too onerous for individual countries to afford. It is therefore in the best interest of the region to pursue partnerships that achieve development while protecting and restoring the environment. Ladies and gentlemen, even as we recognize and salute the contributions to intellectual thoughts and politics of Eric Williams, we also appreciate the new world reality demands. We must appreciate that the world, the new world reality demands that we as successors apply our minds to the new challenges which have emerged since Williams departed the stage. The new reality is that wealth is no longer created through relatively low forms of capital, manpower, and raw material. In this new dispensation, brain power is, the, is demanded to successfully utilize science and technology. This is neither the time nor the place to, pre, uh, to present a full review of the changes which are taking place in the educational sector in the English-speaking Caribbean over the post-Williams era. However, not only have student enrollment and the range of academic offerings of the regional university, the University of the West Indies increased dramatically, but the exclusivity once enjoyed in terms of the provision of university education is no more. Numerous other institutions, domestic and, ex and external, have responded to the demand for expanded access to tertiary education in the region. So even whilst encouraging new players to enter the sector, all necessary steps must be taken to ensure the quality of the offerings. Given the objective of mobility of qualified, skilled members of the labor force throughout the region, there is need for a regional council 
which certifies tertiary offerings from the growing number of institutions. At the same time, bold steps must be taken to define a changed role, a changed role for the University of the West Indies. Ladies and gentlemen, it is becoming more research. It must, because I think we need to do more research. And so it must become more research oriented with focus on public policy analysis and prescriptions for the economic and social sectors as well as the applied sciences. The idea is not novel, but it is now urgent. This is an important prerequisite for the free movement of qualified, skilled personnel throughout the Caribbean single market and the economy. Education must support the integration process and prepare our people for the new realities of the global marketplace. Ladies and gentlemen, another issue which demands immediate attention throughout the region is that of facilitating access of students from low-income families to tertiary institutions. I raise this question as it has been empirically established that the only long-term solution to break in the cycle of poverty is the systematic raising of the levels of education and the training of children from low-income households. I believe that the only barrier the children of the poor should have are those erected in their minds. But when those minds are liberated to think big and, and to achieve, what a region we will have. And ladies and gentlemen, access alone is not enough. We must level the playing field to ensure that deserving students throughout the region are assisted in achieving their true potential. This effort must be uniform across the region. I do not have the statistics of, for all the region's tertiary institutions, but at the Mona campus of the University of the West Indies, Ladies and gentlemen, the ratio of female to male students is four to one. I submit, however, that as we prepare the Anglophone Caribbean for the future, our education policies must be pursued in a manner that addresses the present gender imbalance if we are not to perpetuate the trend of the growing number of our male population losing interest in advancing their educational status. And I say to the women as a woman, it is in our interest as well for the boys to be well educated because if the girls are educated and the boys are not, then what will happen? <laughs> and of course, ladies and gentlemen, I could not conclude any discussion on education without addressing the urgent need for our, for our population, and this one I'm very serious about, and I, I'm sure you will agree with me, for our population to become multilingual. It is only a multilingual workforce that will successfully interface with the world and have the opportunity to improve the economic and social status of our people. We should start this from the very stage of pre-primary, since I believe that if we start them right, we make them bright. The region has best practice example at the University of the West Indies on which we can build. Perhaps it is time for an approach that emphasizing regional cooperation at the secondary and primary level as well. Ladies and gentlemen, this vision for education must embrace the new paradigms of the borderless workplace, providing opportunities for wealth creation driven by technology through brain power and creativity. In 
Eric Williams' vision for the region, he did not restrict himself to the Anglophone Caribbean. There is no doubt that there are special bonds which link the countries of the Caribbean with a common colonial past. Any vision for the Anglophone Caribbean in the 21st century, however, must recognize, ladies and gentlemen, the need for us to break out of the restrictions of the past. We must expand our reach beyond the Caribbean and forge linkages with other nation states within the region, despite the divide of languages and cultures. Wherever we travel, we always find West Indians who readily identify and bond with each other. It is therefore illogical to restrict our prospects for the future to our traditional borders. Even as we retain and build existing relationships, if the Caribbean is to achieve its full potential, it must deepen and expand its relationship within the association of Caribbean states, inclusive of our Spanish, French, and Dutch-speaking neighbors. To do this, however, requires visionary political leadership willing to effectively advance our common interest in, uh, in hemispheric and international fora. It requires a vibrant private sector committed to the expansion of intra-regional economic activity, particularly in non-traditional areas. If, as Dr. Eric Williams suggests, in From Columbus to Castro, Columbus came to conquer the individual islands of the West Indies, then an integrated Caribbean stands in the resistance of those colonial objectives of divide and rule. The current cooperation and collaborations on regional security must be strengthened within and outside the region. Ladies and gentlemen, this is necessary as we seek to provide a safe society for our people that allows them to become competitive entrepreneurs, thereby building a strong economic base. As the Anglophone Caribbean continues to look to the future and to anticipate the needs of our people, and as leaders of the region prepare to meet the challenges of the new world realities, we must be cognizant of the interrelated issues that impact on our strides towards development. I have mentioned some, but as, it, as if as a people we are, if we are committed, I'm sure as a people in the region to advance the development of our individual countries and expanding the leadership we have given to the rest of the world in the past, the eras of collective action, I say to you this afternoon, is limitless. Importantly, we must find a political will to correct the implementation deficit, which has resulted in many well-considered, articulated, and documented policies, plans, and programs for the advancement of our people. Ladies and gentlemen, my vision for the ideas exposed by Dr. Williams to become realities in our time. I hope, and Erica, you have my full support as we work together to ensure this. I hope you will envision with me a truly interdependent Caribbean with a unity of purpose to face the challenges of the new realities. If in capitalism and slavery, Eric Williams' central thesis was how the slave trade was responsible for the rise of the British Industrial Revolution, I say 
that the mission of this and future generation must be to ensure that West Indian freedom and free movement of people are responsible for a Caribbean revolution in excellence and human progress. Before I end, I want to share a story with you because the story is told of two schoolboys who, having captured a bird, conjured up a, a plan to demonstrate to their know-it-all teacher that she does not know everything. The plan was to hold the bird behind their backs and question the teacher on the status of the bird. If she said the bird was alive, they would squeeze it to death. If she said it was dead, they would present the live bird. When they asked their teacher the crucial question, is the bird alive or is it dead? She merely responded, sons, it is in your hands. You can do with it what you will. Ladies and gentlemen, the future of the Caribbean is in our hands. We can make bold new choices. We can take bold decisions to advance the growth of our economies and development of our people or we can choose the traditional path of least resistance. As we honor the memory of one who dared to be bold, a giant, an icon of the Caribbean, one of our most outstanding leaders, I knew the Caribbean will make the right choice and grasp the prospects for the new world realities. There's nothing in the world if we want to achieve that we cannot achieve if we reach out for it. And I say to my brothers and sisters of the region, let us reach out for that prosperity reach out for development, reach out for growth. And I am sure if we do that, not long from now, we will achieve developed country status for all the countries of our region. Let us do it together. Bearing in mind, few fingers can be weak. If you make one big fist, and it has nothing to do with politics, it can deliver It can deliver one fatal blow. Let us, let us deliver that fatal blow to the negatives in our region. Let us build. Let us unite. Let us build. Let us build because we are a great people. We can, we will, and we must in the interest of all our people and for the future generation of West Indians. Thank you so much. God bless you. I thank you. At this time, I'd like to ask Dr. Deanne Butchie to please join me. Um, she is an assistant dean in the Assurance of Learning and Accreditation, an instructor in the Department of Finance and Real Estate. And if I recall, we always have microphones in the audience for anyone who has questions. Dr. Butchie. Thank you. Am I on? Yep. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, it is with great pride that as a fellow West Indian, 
that I've heard from a strong, accomplished woman leader of the Caribbean. I would like, it is truly fitting that Mrs. Simpson, Mrs. M Simpson Miller has spoken today, the first woman prime minister of Jamaica at a lecture series that memorializes the first prime minister of Trinidad and Tobago, the father of our nation. Thank you very much. Please join me in another round of applause for Mrs. Portia Simpson Miller. At this point, I know you are very willing to and, and, and very excited to hear more inspirational words from Mrs. Miller. And I would like to open up the floor right now for additional questions. But there are some rules. Uh, I, when you're acknowledged, when you're recognized, I would like you to come out to the aisles where you can meet one of our volunteers and you can use their microphones so that we can hear you. So do I have any questions from Mrs. Miller? Please. Volunteer. It was a pleasure, Madam. Pleasure. Thank you very much for that intellectual educational lecture. What I would like, as you were talking, I would like to know your impression of how the English Caribbean is going with the um, common market, Caribbean common market. Do you think there's any progress in the English Caribbean? To be honest, I must say that I am a little disappointed that we are not yet where we should be. I think the challenge is that we have our systems of government in the region. We have elections every five years. And so we have um, changes in government and the continuity of that kind of passion to get it done perhaps is not there. I know, for example, in Jamaica, the, when the former Prime Minister of Jamaica, my immediate predecessor, was Prime Minister. He was one of those leaders who continued to push for, but the then opposition was not supporting as much. But I think they are getting there, and I'm hoping that they will intensify the work to ensure that that is done. Um, can you imagine if perhaps we had captured Eric Williams' dream of a federation we are not so sure what would happen, but perhaps we could be now like the um, EU in terms of strength as a region as, and as a people. And I think that's where we should really work to get to. Get to. And it's not impossible, but as opposition, I can assure you that we're working very hard to push. And I hope the governments of the region will be bold enough to push for us to get the CSME in place. Thank you, that was a very important question. We have a question over here. Honorable Prime Minister, um, that was a very good lecture, very intellectual. My question is in regards to Cuba and incorporating Cuba into the Caribbean as a whole as one of the main players in advancement for uh, universal um, you know, co collaboration with the high literacy that they have there. Do you think Cuba should be one of the main players as, um, I mean, joined with CARICOM? They are part, they are now part of, they sit, they, they, we attend meetings and as a matter of fact, sometimes meetings are held um, in Cuba where CARICOM leaders attend. I think Cuba is very important and critical, particularly to our region. 
because they do assist the region despite their, their limited resources. It's interesting the number of doctors that Cuba trained for co some countries of the region, including my country, Jamaica. And as you pointed out, the high level of their education system and their health and with li limited resources, their achievements, it is a country that certainly, um, I'm not even talking now about the, the region because we consider them a part of the region. Um, I really believe at this time, the, the United States should revisit their decision on the embargo on Cuba. Uh, uh, this gentleman was there first, and then we'll have you after. Thank you. Um, good evening, Ms. Simpson Miller. Thank you for the um, lecture. I just wanted to ask. Oh, just wanted to ask about the um, questions about the brain drain, um, the, the amount of talented minds that are leaving the Caribbean and going to study in other places, such as the United States, and study in um, Europe. Um, one of the problems I would see in Jamaica and other places in the Caribbean as well is these minds that leave Jamaica and the Caribbean, they don't readily come back. So how do we um, successfully brand um, the Jamaican minds and the other Caribbean minds as well as, as we've successfully branded our um, Caribbean athletes? Well, I, I think that the challenge is not only leaving to study abroad. We welcome the studies because there are a number of um, Jamaican students and parents who they just love FIU. They just love Cornell University. They just love a number of the American universities. The problem is when we train them and they leave to come to the United States and other countries of the world rather than staying home to make their contribution. But I think that our economies do have a lot to do with that. And that is why I envisioned not long from now a region well developed and we, we will deliver that fatal blow to um, slow growth and low growth and negative growth to growth beyond compare that just like China that was seen as an um, underdeveloped country in the past is now one of the third largest developed countries in the world. I think if China can do it, we can do it too. And I'm saying it to you with all sincerity as a Jamaican, because the last four letters in the word Jamaican is I C A N, I can. And I'm sure the region can. But um, when I was Prime Minister, I was putting a number of initiatives in place to um, ensure that the young professionals would remain in, in, in Jamaica, speaking specifically for Jamaica, you mentioned Jamaica, because um, young professionals, the first thing they need, a house and a car. And if they could get that, I'm sure, and do have a job, then they would remain. And that's why I, I was looking at the National Housing Trust to build affordable housing that could attract young professionals and middle-income persons. And certainly, I'm sure if we were able to achieve that, a number of our young professionals um, migrating to seek a livelihood would remain in Jamaica at home to make their contribution to the building of their homeland. I would just like to take the opportunity to let Mrs. Miller know that we at FIU are trying to do our part I don't know if you're aware, but we do offer from the College of Business an executive MBA, College of Engineering, College of... Uh, we are prof the professors from our school come to ensure that your students remain and learn from us and do their part for t building the country. It is true, and we have a number of other universities who come and offer um, programs to Jamaicans at home 
and um, we have distant learning as well. And, and so we are doing well, and that's why I spoke about um, looking at all the institutions coming in to offer um, tertiary education to our people. So I, I think that, and, and we welcome, and we welcome FIU uh, to Jamaica. And when you are trained at FIU, you know what you're getting. So we welcome FIU. <laughs> and, and we want to thank you for your contribution to our country and to the development of our people. Thank you. Uh, Ma'am? Thank you. Thank you very much for coming tonight. Um, you had mentioned very briefly a regional food security plan. And um, I just wanted to ask, with the prevalence of a cash crop economy in the Caribbean, what measures are taking place right now to try and alleviate some of that so that the people of the Caribbean can actually supply their own resources in regards to food? Well, I think we do, um, we do quite a lot of vegetables in terms of farming where a number of our farmers supplies, they, they supply the hotels as well and our supermarkets and shops. But when I talk about um, food security, I think in a number of the countries, we tend to use the agricultural lands to build houses rather than ensuring that we are providing enough to feed our people. And more and more you see agricultural lands, good agricultural lands, disappearing while structures are going, are going up, housing in particular. And um, I really believe that the region should begin to look at this so that we ensure food security for our people. this side we have a gentleman who has uh, I, I want to go male female male female if possible we want an equal opportunity here uh, I'd like to hear from the gentleman first <laughs> honorable Prime Minister uh, my name is Cornell Sims and my question is you articulated pretty much a very good regional development plan I think it's a very good initiative so my question is what role can the Caribbean diaspora play and others in actually accomplishing that plan that you articulated. Very brilliant. Very important. A very good question and I am so happy that you asked that question because I believe that you can make your contribution. I think in the same way the Jews make their contribution to building their homeland, the Caribbean diaspora can make their contribution to the building of the Caribbean. I think that perhaps the governments of the region should also come up with some investment instrument. So for the diaspora, and we should make the region investment friendly to the diaspora so that members of the diaspora will invest in their homeland. And anywhere in the region, a Trinidadian can invest in Jamaica, Jamaica in Trinidad, in Antigua, in St. Lucia, name it. Um, I think it can be done. But I, for Jamaica, speaking for Jamaica, we have a strong diaspora organization that was established um, by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And I hope that uh, Jamaicans are participating so that you can let your, your, your voice be heard back home in Jamaica and you can make your contribution. And I believe that the region should mobilize our sons and daughters so that you can be a party to all the discussions in terms of our policies, governance, because it is your, your land, and it doesn't matter where you live. One thing you cannot deny, deny that your navel string was not cut and buried back home, whether it is Jamaica, Trinidad, 
In Jamaica, we know it's always buried under a fruit tree. <laughs> I don't know what is happening in the rest of the region. But I think it is very important, and you can be assured, I can only speak for Jamaica now on the diaspora, because I'm, I'm not, I do not know how strong the, the other countries are with, 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 with their uh, persons in, in the diaspora, but I know, for example, remittances, very important to Jamaica, and as I'm sure to the region, and um, I think that we should mobilize the regional diaspora and the governments and opposition should work with you all for the betterment of our region because you can make a valuable contribution. Allow me, permit me to say that anywhere you go in the world, I travel as a Jamaican and everywhere I go, you go to an hospital, they tell you of a great doctor a number of times. That great doctor is from the Caribbean. They talk about an educator. People, whether in the health service, name it. Jamaica. Science. Caribbean. We have produced many greats. As I said to you, <laughs> Ah, Bolt and Lara, and others, and we have many others. It is for us to, you know, if we could harness the creativity of our people in the region, there's no other region in the world that could beat, could defeat our little region, because we are a great people. Hey, Mrs. Miller has had a very long couple of days. I know she's very exhausted, even though she's si still inspiring us all to do better. Uh, I would have one last question, and I'm seeing um, a question from the person here, please. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, my name is Wahungu. I I want, first of all, thank First of all, I would like to thank you, the Prime Minister. I think you are a, an inspiration to many people, not only in the Caribbean, but all over the world. To have a female president, a Prime Minister, it's the same as president, and leader of a country, is very, very inspiring. Everything you do, there are little girls all over the world watching. And so whatever you're doing, keep up doing, especially what you're doing internationally. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're welcome. And with those last words, I would like no, to... No, I, 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 would, I would, since we have, I think, two persons okay. left, could we... Um, just to, uh, just to allow. Let's I hear will, from this side. Yep. I will. I will allow for. Okay. Let's yes. hear from this side, please. Uh, yes, thank please. you for coming today. Um, you touched on some things that are personal to you know my family and, and my heart. Uh, one of them being energy and oil consumption and um, the misuse of our resources. So I wanted to ask you specifically with Jamaica because I know that's going to be what you, you you know the most. What steps have been taken to kind of change the the dynamic of, of power consumption in Jamaica, especially with oil use and, and the lack of alternative uh, sustainable uh, power sources. And um, also, what, what steps would entrepreneurs take in the environment that, that's in that country right now, in the Caribbean in general, to, to help change the, the thought process and the mindset of that region? Um, i just like to say we started in Jamaica um, to look at um, using ethanol from sugarcane, and we are we are presently looking at that is the opposition on other agricultural plants like oil nut and palm to generate um, biodiesel 
And um, we're also thinking of looking at when the people of Jamaica call upon us to be government again, lo looking at using... Uh, looking at biomass, looking at using garbage to generate energy. We, we have um, wind farms in Jamaica. We're looking at expanding that, uh, looking at solar, solar energy as well, and hydropower, um, because we have water, and I'm sure that we would be able to do something um, if my memory serves me right, I think we have um, hydropower plants in three locations um, in Jamaica, and we would look to expand those. So we are looking at a number of areas, and there are some people who are talking about the possibility of exploring clean coal as well. So we are looking at a number of areas that we, we, we would be able to move at. But, but I would love to see collaboration within the region so that as a region, we will not have to be dependent on others, but we would be able to depend on ourselves in this area. Okay, one last question. From and thank you very much, very important question. Thank you. This is a topic that some of the other questions have touched on. Um, the idea in Edward Said's Orientalism about strategic location and strategic advantage uh, related to empire building and population movements over the years. Um, do you have any comments about um, where literary images of tourism and economies um, might be affecting inherent strategic location and strategic advantage. Uh, it was a very difficult question, no, Mrs. No, <laughs> I, I believe she was asking about strategic decisions for tourism. Uh, that was the genesis of what I got from her. Uh, are there strategic decisions made about tourism, for example? Well, I call for a regional um, tourism plan for us to look at it, and at the same time, we're looking at, at the tourism and building hotel rooms. We need to look at the environment as well and to protect the environment. In terms of tourism, I can say for Jamaica, I spearheaded and completed a tourism master plan for sustainable development that we are now benefiting from in Jamaica because it is being implemented. Um, I started, we started implementing and the present government is continuing the implementation of that um, plan for tourism sustainable development in Jamaica. But I would love to see a regional plan that we could look at. Um, my, all the countries are marketing themselves individually. And, and we could look, for example, um, there could be collaboration in terms of, of, of air transportation where someone could go to um, Trinidad or St. Lucia, Bahamas, Antigua, and then fly to Jamaica or from Jamaica to, and that's why I mentioned uh, uh, Caribbean um, airline direct flights because air lift is also important. Um, to enhance visitor arrivals to our countries, our various countries. And if we had the kind of collaboration and unity within the region, we could be supporting each other because they could get the, the experience of the region by in one trip. For example, the Europeans love to stay long. They are long stay visitors, <laughs> yes. And, and they, they travel, they could visit more than one of the countries in the region on one visit and experience the friendliness of our people and um, food, music, whether it is Trinidad's music or Jamaica's reggae or 
the food that I mentioned earlier, and, and certainly our heritage, heritage tourism, I think we should be doing more and promoting our culture. There are things to see, places to go, and things to do. And it's not just about a name. We do have a number of, of, of attractions that, that if optimized our region, none could compare. Well, Mrs. Miller, you have given us a lot of thought, a lot of room for thought, and a lot of things that we West Indians can do to help the region. And I thank you very much again for imparting your words of wisdom to us and for our uh, wonderful university for facilitating this and Erica herself in having the perseverance to keep doing this for the last 11 years. Thank, thank you. you. Could you allow me to thank you, to thank FIU, to thank Erica, and to thank, most of all, the audience that came out here this afternoon. I want to thank you so much for your participation and for allowing me to speak with you this afternoon. Um, thank you so much. God bless you. And to the Americans, I say the last four letters in American is I C A N I CAN. And so, America, Caribbean, Together we can do it. Together we can make it work. Let us unite. Let us do it. Let us get it right. Thank you very much for our peoples. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Before we leave, just a couple more comments. Um, I'd like to invite um, Dr. Andrew Queeley, Assistant Professor of Global and Sociocultural Studies at the African and African Diaspora Studies Faculty. Good evening, everybody. How's everybody doing? Good? All right. So we just have a, a couple more announcements. Um, first, you know, this evening would not be possible without our sponsors, so we must mention them. Um, first, our gold sponsors, the Eric Williams Memorial Collection of the University of the West Indies, um, the Caribbean Consular Corps of Miami, Florida, and the Miami-Dade County Department of Cultural Affairs. Please give them a round of applause. Um, and also, we'd like to thank our community and corporate sponsors, um, Delancey Hill Professional Association, Diane Galloway's Herbal Gardens Incorporated, Jask Creations, Joy's Roti Delight, Emil Sabga, and Trinidad and Tobago Diaspora Incorporated. And also, we'd like to have a, give a special thanks to Dip Singh of Dipcom Construction and Professor Leroy Lashley and the Miami-Dade College. Um, so in a few moments, we um, would like to invite you to um, the Rotunda for book signing and sale and also dessert rece reception that's going to follow this program. Um, but first, before we do that, we'll have a few words from attorney Marlon Hill, who's a community activist and member of the Delancey Hill Professional Association, as well as the Jamaican Diaspora Advisory Board, the Southern U.S. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Were you challenged tonight? Were you emboldened tonight? Were you inspired tonight? Yes. Well, to, to whom much is given, much is expected. You are indebted to the Africa and African um, Diaspora Studies here at Florida International University. Um, no community anywhere in the world, in any community, can survive without the individual support of those persons involved in this community. Um, in this community of intellect and in this community of intelligence, um, you are indebted to make a contribution. So if you open up your program, you will see a pledge card, of which I filled out mine already, um, that in ensuring that we have the 12th annual Eric Williams Memorial Lecture Series right here with the Department of Africa and African Diaspora Studies, we're asking you to make a commitment, a personal commitment, 
I know that with the economy, we are going through challenging times, but we all, as a community, together, whether we're from the Caribbean or not, can ensure that we continue this community of inter intellect and intelligence. So if you pull out your pledge cards, you will see you will make a contribution payable to Florida International University. For all the students who are in here, I know you pay tuition every year, but I know you can forego the next pizza in your dorm room. You can forego the next party that you're going to next week and make that contribution as well. We're not asking you to, to forego your entire estate plan, but every person in this room ought to be able to make a contribution. Check, credit card, or cash. Make it payable to Florida International University and also put in the memo FBO. Madam Prime Minister, as the advisory board member for the Jamaican Diaspora of Southern United States, it's a point of personal privilege. Um, when you diverted there to the Akian Sawfish and the, and the Cuckoo and the Bosop Shadam, you distracted me from the idea of regional integration, but you, get, you brought me back on track. Um, it's just a, a pleasure to have you here in South Florida again. Thank you for inspiring us and challenging us and emboldening us, as always. Uh, we appreciate you very much. Um, so this evening, we encourage you to go out into the lobby and to also purchase one of the DVDs of uh, one of the prior lectures um, over the last 11 years, um, whether it was Edwidge Danticat or Dr. Rampasad or um, Dr. John Hope Franklin. We want to encourage you to purchase one of those DVDs, or you can purchase two um, for $25. Um, we look forward to having you again next year for the 12th annual Eric Williams Memorial Lecture Series. We want to thank Florida International University, the Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rosenberg. So, um, please extend our thanks to him for hosting us here again. So uh, you made me the promise. You made me the promise? Okay, please fill out the pledge card and support um, the continuation of this community of intelligence. Thank you for being here this evening.